a brief overview of the kind of um, research we are doing in the AI lab. And I will do it in two rounds uh, because this presentation here is more like a public relation uh, pitch. So uh, then I will go to the website and then discuss some of the topics we are doing because uh, people here are computer scientists and I think they want to know a bit more about what's going on today. Um, also, before I start, maybe uh, I should say uh, what I'm doing here in Kenya. And uh, I have been involved in um, a large number of um, collaborations of uh, my government. With, they do it with several universities in, 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 the, in the South. And one of the, 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 the most important countries we are working with together is Kenya. And since 2000, I'm involved with the University of Nairobi. And uh, okay, my first uh, PhD student here in Kenya is uh, Professor Waganjo over there. And I think he did his PhD on machine learning in 2003. So that must be one of the first in, uh, in Africa, I guess. And since then, um, I was also involved in, uh, uh, at Moy University. I still have two PhD students working over there. Now at the short visit, uh, Kenyatta University, uh, there is Stratmore, there is a new uh, program uh, with Jews and uh, Bondo, uh, etc. So that's uh, a brief introduction. Now we can take uh, um, okay, a, a brief overview of what's happening. First of all, the lab was uh, founded in uh, 1983 by Professor Luke Steels, who's also retired already. And um, it's as far as we can check, it's, it, it must be the first AI lab on the European continent. So before that, you had only AI labs in the United States and also Great Britain had a program uh, on AI. And uh, okay, Professor Luke Stills, he um, um, got his master and PhD at the uh, MIT AI lab. And especially in the um, beginning, we had a lot of visitors from, from uh, the MIT AI lab. So Marvin Minsky, one of the founding fathers of AI, was a regular visitor. Rodney Brooks, who's working on robotics, especially behavior-based robotics, was a regular visitor. Uh, by the way, both um, Marvin Minsky and Noam Chomsky, who's working in linguistics, uh, got an honorary uh, PhD at uh, uh, my university. By the way, also Nelson Mandela. So maybe that's interesting to know. <laughs> yeah. And uh, okay, as you can see, I mean, we go uh, uh, back and in, 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 um, quite for some time. So it's almost uh, uh, 40 years. And okay, the number of publications, the number of uh, PhD students that graduated, etc. You have uh, a short overview over there. So, uh, okay, uh, most universities in Europe, they get a lot of funding from the governments, even if they are not uh, government universities. But apart from that, I mean, uh, most of our funding is coming from all kinds of uh, uh, projects from the European Union, etc., um, etc. Et okay, maybe I should also mention that Brussels is the capital of the European Union. It's also the, 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 the seat of the NATO, so which is a bit scary nowadays <laughs> because of the conflict between Ukraine and, uh, and Russia. So if the Russians want to attack, then maybe Brussels is both for NATO and EU might be a target. Also SWIFT, the international uh, uh, money system, uh, which now they excluded Russia from, is based near Brussels. Uh, and by the way, also Waterloo. I mean, all Kenyans know Waterloo. <laughs> But some they expect it's in the in the in the UK, but it's also near Brussels. Okay, so that's the that, that that's um, uh, more or less the the, the, the history. Now um, you we can summarize the research what we are doing in adaptive learning. Okay, and later on you will see what well, why I call it adaptive learning because in a sense learning is also adaptive, and the reason is because we not only do let's say standard learning, which can be seen as optimization. So for instance, if you, you, you think about uh, deep learning, then um, what you're doing there is you're you are, um, optimizing uh, an error surface um, so that, uh, okay, you're looking for the minimum. Yeah? So that's standard um, optimization. But, uh, but once you uh, start to involve um, um, other agents with their own goals, their own preferences, etc. Then, instead of uh, optimization, it becomes strategic interactions, and then you need new tools 
um, okay, one of the tools is game theory, which was developed in economics. Yeah, and um, uh, okay, a central concept over there is what is called uh, Nash equilibrium. And uh, okay, the principle they can be computed, but often it's uh, okay, it's an NP hard problem. So one way to try to discover these uh, these Nash equilibria is by um, uh, by learning. So that's why we call it adaptive learning because you are learning in an environment which is not stationary. Because okay, the, the behavior of other agents is also changing, etc. So the the it becomes some kind of uh, co-evolution between uh, agents. Uh, and then we uh, are applying that to um, all kind of um, applications. Uh, for instance, smart grids. Okay, nowadays, uh, and and okay, because of the conflict in Europe, we will move much faster to renewable uh, energy. Yeah, uh, many people they have uh, okay solar panels. Yeah, and uh, okay, you want to connect many households. Uh, some might have a demand for electricity, others they do have electricity. If you don't use your car regularly, you can use it, uh, the battery of the car to, to store temporarily, and you want to connect all these people and have some kind of negotiation system and some kind of uh, automatic auction system so that they can uh, share energy at, at favorable uh, prices. So this is one of the applications. Um, we have also done a lot of data analytics. Uh, analytics. Okay, and uh, machine learning you find it everywhere, but in different domains they are using different words for what is basically the same. So we have data mining in the context of economics, they talk about uh, analytics, etc. But let's say that the learning aspect is basically the same. Um, okay, many of the machine learning algorithms, also the standard machine learning algorithms, they are um, they are uh, black boxes. For instance, if you have a neural network that um, learned to solve a task and which uh, does it very well, uh, I mean, for the for the user, you don't know based on what is um, is the system uh, making the decision because the knowledge in the neural network is in the weights. Yeah. It's not in, in the rules which can be understood by humans. And so we are also looking at uh, explainable AI, and, and the approach we are doing is like try to 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 um, learn from what happens inside the the, the black box. Uh, it's not a white box like you have very explicit rules, so we call it uh, gray box learning. Uh, but I think um, the the real approach to uh, explainable AI. And we are not working on that uh, topic yet, is causality. I think it's one of the major research areas in, um, in, in computer science machine learning uh, nowadays, because I think the only good explanations are causal explanations. Um, what else do we have over there? Okay, yeah, um, the, the founder of the lab, Professor um, Luke Stales, was by education a linguistic. And uh, so um, uh, he and a number of people, they looked at how language can emerge in, in, in the society of agents. So the experiment they were, uh, they were doing is called talking heads. So we had a number of uh, cameras that could look at a screen like this, and that you had a, a number of simple geometric objects, like circles, squares, triangles, and they also had like uh, a few different colors. And then they developed automatically a language to, to, to talk about these objects. So this is one of the things that was happening over there. Okay, there's a bit of reflection and I don't, I think, okay, so this gives already uh, a rough overview of what we are doing. And I should also take a, a look at the time. I forgot at what time that we started. Yeah. Ten. 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 Okay. So I will skip a few of them, and the slides okay, will also be uh, available at the end of these presentations. So I want to go to some, uh, okay, so with whom we are working together. Okay, we are the AI lab, so that's the, by the way, the colors of our universities are blue and orange, so that's why you see a lot of blue and orange. Yeah. And uh, okay, so we have the AI lab in the computer science department. But apart from that, we are also working uh, together with uh, a group which called themselves Digital Mathematics, under a little bit strange, but <laughs> um, 
And okay, and their bachelor program, now they have the option uh, data science. So it has been introduced a few years ago. And, um, and okay, like the, the person to the right, the, the man, you have a lady and a man. So he was one of the, 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 the important person in modeling the, the COVID um, epidemic in Belgium. And, and then based on that, they were deciding what measures to do. And we also work with, um, together with the data uh, analy uh, analytics lab. So these are then people in the, in the MBA uh, department. Because okay, one of the major applications of machine learning data mining nowadays is in, the, in, in that area. And okay, so these are the professors. So to the, to the left uh, bottom, these are now the current professors in the AI lab, but we, we have a huge number of them. Uh, postdocs, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, from uh, several countries, and then the person, uh, the first row to the right, so he's my uh, successor, and he was also working on modeling uh, uh, diseases, first uh, HIV, and now he's also involved in modeling the, um, the epidemic of uh, uh, COVID. Okay, so I will continue to talk about um, research. Um, okay, maybe another thing about Brussels, what uh, people uh, often don't know is it's a bilingual city. So it's both uh, Dutch, which is dialect of the Netherlands. It's like English and American English, Flemish and, um, and Dutch. And then you have the, the, the French speaking part, but they have their own funding, etc. And okay, there are two free universities in Brussels, so a French speaking and a Dutch speaking. And French it's ULB, Université Libre de Bruxelles. And we're also working together with them quite a lot. Then there is what you see, IB Square. This is a, um, a research institute uh, funded by the Brussels government, uh, devoted to, um, to bioinformatics. And we, so the computer science departments of the, the French and the Dutch speaking university. Um, and then the, the, the university hospital, uh, hospitals, they are working in that area and in the, on our website, and you can see a lot of projects that we are doing. And then we have a lot of um, um, other sponsors. Okay, the founder of the lab was also for some time head of the Sony Research Lab in uh, Paris. So that's why Sony is, um, is mentioned over there. And maybe I, I should say, uh, um, a little bit about education. So in our master program, we have, have a specialization in artificial intelligence. So students, they have to, have to choose a specialization over there. And um, uh, the, the academic year that will start in September, uh, we will have a bachelor in artificial intelligence. And it will not only be devoted to, let's say, uh, machine learning, etc., also cognitive AI, etc or what is called um, uh, artificial general intelligence will be uh, a topic in that uh, program. If you want to know uh, more, so that's the website over there. And then the rest I can skip. Okay, maybe um, uh, one thing. So uh, uh, recently we opened the AI um, Experience Center and then the lady that you see uh, a bit to the left so she's the head of the European Commission. So she came to, to open because also the EU will now, although we uh, invest already quite a lot of money in AI, they will invest even uh, more uh, to, to, to remain competitive with both the United States and with um, uh, China. Okay, so I can skip all that. Okay, one of the, 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 the major areas, and I have uh, mentioned that already, is that we are doing uh, multi-agents um, um, AI. Yeah. So when you have multiple agents interacting with each other, and what you see over there is the smart grid application, and um, later on I'll show some other applications where we are applying multi-agents. So, uh, and that's like, and if you want to do um, learning in the context of uh, multi-agents, then um, the kind of learning used over there is reinforcement learning. Yeah. Okay, nowadays, 
most of machine learning, when people are talking about this, we are talking about supervised learning, classification versus regression, and maybe also clustering, things like that. But usually, uh, reinforcement learning is not uh, mentioned. Uh, while, uh, because, okay, here you, you will work on, on uh, the Internet of Things, but I think for many uh, IoT applications, reinforcement learning will be uh, very important. Because there you learn uh, on based on feedback you are getting from uh, your environment. Okay, as a child, you learned how to. You have a question? If I may ask. Yeah. Um, in this specific topic, uh, um, in this specific application space, yes, yeah. like uh, smart grids and so forth, um, the main problem in the reinforcement learning sort of deals with is the delay to work problem. Yeah. And the way that we are currently dealing with it in terms of yeah. the algorithm to work is by sort of bypassing that problem and yeah. throwing huge computation and simulation at yeah. it. So we need to play a lot of different yeah. things in order to try to explore the possible solution yeah. space. How, and in, in these applications, you don't have that capacity. They're typically much smaller, have smaller data sets, more yeah. difficult to simulate. Um, how, how, how will do Reinforcement learning approaches well. Okay, but you can bootstrap your learning by doing offline uh, offline learning in a simulated environment uh, before you really start to to, to 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 do it in the real world. That's one thing. And by the way, in, in, in this application, we are um, focused on on uh, uh, so-called auctions, automatic auctions, and that's a specialized topic in game theory which is a, a subfield in microeconomics. And, and there you can have algorithms where you don't have to do uh, uh, too much of, of uh, learning. Yeah. Um, OK, and you also, uh, it's not only about learning, because also in reinforcement learning, you will act in your um, environment. So by the way, there is a, a close relation between control uh, theory in engineering and reinforcement learning. But traditionally, control theory, they start from a mathematical model of the environment. And OK, then they had techniques on how to control optimally that environment. While uh, typically, for, um, uh, typically for reinforcement learning is that you don't have that model of, um, of the environment. So uh, what happens over there is what is called model-free uh, learning. Also, a difference between um, Control theory, although nowadays in control theory, they are also using a lot of uh, reinforcement learning uh, because for uh, more complex control problems, you also don't have a good mathematical model, etc. But uh, another difference is that in uh, control theory, your uh, action space, so the actions available to the agents are continuous, while in the problems we are solving is they are finite and usually quite uh, limited. But there are connections between um, but, uh, between these uh, domains. Um, okay, so this is an overview of a number of uh, topics. Maybe I should also mention. So one of the, the, the professors which was hired a couple of years ago is working on computational uh, creativity. I think must be one of the few people uh, in, in the world. But okay, I don't know too much uh, about that. Okay, again, so you see the the, the, the president of the European Commission, so you are very proud, so that's why you will see them on many pictures. Okay, so uh, before I continue, uh, maybe I, I should say uh, a little bit about the, the history of AI. And uh, uh, okay, many people are surprised that uh, how old artificial intelligence is, because uh, now it's in the news every day, and many people think okay, it's new. And actually, it's the second oldest topic in computer science. Okay, the first uh, one was, of course, new numerical uh, recipes. And also the, sec the second largest uh, programming language, which is still in use today, is LISP. Yeah, stands for list processing. Uh, while Fortran is the oldest, which is used also for uh, numerical uh, computations. And so it started in the, 15, uh, in the 50s. The name artificial intelligence was um, um, case it was uh, used in 1956 because there was a conference with like 15 people that, but that were working on AI um, uh, joined and, and like the, the field was a bit um, uh, defined. 
Uh, as a starting point, often a, a paper of um, Alan Turing, so famous mathematician, in 1950, and you can find it online freely, and it's still worth, worth, uh, worthwhile, uh, worthwhile to read. I mean, whatever happened in the whole history uh, of AI was more or less already explained in the paper. Um, and by the way, he also gives a very interesting, uh, well, it's not exactly a definition of AI, because it's hard to define artificial intelligence. And by the way, when I was young, if you were good in, 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 in uh, adding up numbers, you were considered to be very intelligent. No one looked at artificial intelligence. Yeah. And the same is true for other things. I mean, maybe people in, in the sex would have said, okay, uh, I will believe that you have created AI if you can win in, 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 uh, in uh, chess. Yeah. Now it happened and I say, oh, but it's not AI because the way you do it is very different from, from, from the way that a human is, uh, is, um, is doing it. Yeah. And so in a sense, the definition of AI is always shifting, Okay, at least for the outside world. Yeah. And, and do you know what the solution of uh, Turing was? Well, he said, yeah, okay, you can interact with, um, with two agents. Yeah? One is a human, and another one is an AI agent. And you can interact as long as you want. You can, do, you can ask questions. You can uh, have a conversation for a very long time. And if you cannot make a distinction between the two, yeah, then it's intelligent in some way. And he also predicted that AI would exist by 2000, which, of course, is not true. Yeah. And what you see over there in the beginning, that there was a, uh, okay, in the beginning of AI, they did both uh, machine learning and what is called uh, symbolic AI. So this is like based on, on, um, on logic or rule-based systems, etc. And uh, the, the, the fight was lost by the sub-symbolics. Okay, the sub-symbolics is what we nowadays would call machine learning, but that word did not exist yet. And there were some people already in the 50s like Samuel, he, he wrote a program to, to play checkers. So checkers is a game or trot in English. Uh, there was also evolutionary algorithms. Um, uh, but okay, the, the, these people uh, lost the fight and for, until the, the, the mid 80s, I mean, artificial intelligence was like uh, symbolic. And then in the, the mid uh, 80s, then there was, a, a, and one of the reasons that's another thing. If you want to understand what's happening in AI, then you always have to, 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 to look at Moore's law. Uh, I don't know if you are aware of that. Okay, the Moore was was the CEO of either uh, HP or Intel. And in the 60s, um, he, he wrote a paper because he, uh, the, the company observed that um, uh, every one and a half year, uh, up to two years, the, the, the computation power was doubling. Yeah. No, since the, the 50s and now, if you look at the, the number of doublings, that's huge. Yeah. And one of the reasons why machine learning didn't work in the 50s, okay, if you know, if you, um, uh, if you are applying deep learning, if you see how much uh, energy and, and computation time you are using, then you know in these days it was not feasible. Yeah. Now in the, 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 the mid 80s, there was a, 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 a revival of sub-symbolic at that time, machine learning was still not uh, used. And uh, what you had over there was like fuzzy logic, was neural networks, was um, evolutionary computation, uh, etc. But But even then, uh, okay, in a sense, what is now called deep learning uh, emerged already um, in the mid 80s. Okay, the, 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 the basic structure of the feed forward network, which learns by backpropagation of errors, also known as a stochastic gradient, was already there. But again, if you then uh, keep Moore's law in mind, what we can do today in one second is like you needed 24 hours uh, at that time. Yeah? So that explains a lot why then these um, um, disappeared a bit. Then another reason is, I don't know, okay, you have an American company, so you have experience with American uh, people, also American uh, scientists, they are very good in, in selling what they are doing. And as a result, they oversell. And what you, we had over there was like the first AI winter. Okay, by the way, what do you think is the biggest sponsor in artificial intelligence, even today? In terms of companies? Yeah. 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 It's still DARPA, so the, the defense agency in the United States, especially in the beginning. But even now, if there's uh, big companies, 
Um, and still DARPA, which is the, the, the biggest sponsor of artificial intelligence. By the way, DARPA sponsors the work of uh, Page and Brin, the founders of uh, Google. <laughs> DARPA <laughs> supports the internet. So yeah. it's, oh, yeah. the, the internet of the internet. So it's difficult to... Uh, okay, the, the, what, all the technology needed for, um, for, um, for smartphones was uh, developed over there. Um, even... Um, even in um, um, okay, public encryption techniques, no, we don't want you to use it, but you've done it in the, in the first place. Um, so people will, uh, were overselling, and you had, uh, and I'm afraid that the same thing might happen today. Uh, and then you had what they call the first AI winter. Actually, by the way, so um, the AI lab was founded in the middle of the of the. Um, um, of the 80s, so we have experienced, I mean, the battle between these two camps. Uh, that's when we started to work on, on, on machine learning, although the, no was, the work was not known yet. And, uh, okay, compared to, to big labs in, uh, in other parts of Europe and, and the United States, I mean, we cannot do everything. So that's why, okay, by historical accident, we focused on, on, on machine learning. So most of the most of the research we were doing was more related to, to machine learning in general, be it reinforcement learning, be it uh, standard machine learning techniques, be it Bayesian uh, machine learning, et cetera, et cetera. Because, okay, if you want to compete, then you have to find your uh, niche. Uh, you cannot uh, compete with MIT or Carnegie Mellon or, or, or whatever. Uh, also, neural networks in the mid 80s, uh, some people they were explaining this like some kind of uh, Deus ex machina, I mean, like magic. Yeah. But actually, if you wanted to uh, understand what's happening, you, you needed um, um, uh, statistical thinking, probabilistic thinking, etc. By the way, um, one of the reasons why probabilistic thinking it took such a long time. Again, there was uh, before the, the one the, the techniques were not available to do clever inference uh, on the one hand, and also again the Moore's, uh, Moore's law, uh, the, the resources were not there. So, for instance, if you want to talk about uncertainty, let's say in, 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 in the mid 80s, then there were other formalisms which could be uh, done in a tractable way like Dempster uh, Schaefer theory uh, that was used in uh, uh, expert systems for, for uh, medicine, because there we talk about uncertainty. But OK, I think the right way to do is it uh, based on probability theory, but then it could not be done. And one of the, 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 the people that did a, a lot of work in that area was uh, Judea Pearl. Um, okay, he's one of the inventors of Bayesian networks. And because, OK, and by the way, that's one of the contributions that computer science is doing um, added to uh, the mathematical theory. Uh, OK, mathematics, if you know, if a mathematician, if, uh, if he or she knows one, there is a solution or I can converse to the solution, then they stop over there. While in machine learning, you are looking at, at the, 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 the time complexity. Yeah. And you would like that you, the time complexity is a uh, polynomial. And so the initial um, algorithms, they were exponential. But then what, what Perl did was, OK, uh, if you look at these mathematical, mathematical theories, then you can uh, um, make graphical representations of probability distributions. And you can explode the, 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 the graph structure in order to approximate the efficient and time uh, inference. And by the way, uh, Judy Pearl is also one of the, the, the persons that had started to work on causality later on. So causality is now also a hot topic in, uh, in computer science and machine learning. But by the way, it's also a hot, a hot topic in, 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 in medicine and in economics. So for instance, the, the last Nobel Prize in, in economics was given to people that try to understand causality in the context of um, in the context of uh, economics. Yeah. Can you explain causality a bit more? About? Um, explain causality a bit more. Like what, are, what are the big questions? Where is it hot now? Uh, OK. OK, causality. First of all, we are talking about um, um, probabilistic uh, causality. I mean, uh, physics is a lot of deterministic. But for instance, if you want to understand whether uh, smoking 
uh, causes uh, uh, problems for your lung. I mean, some people, they will get sick, others will not sick, because it depends on um, uh, many different ways. Now, one of the, the okay, and the, 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 okay, and this is typically uh, uh, a scientific uh, approach. I mean, that's how scientists are thinking, yeah? Um, and, and, and the way they do it is, okay, you set up uh, a controlled experiment. You have a control group, um, yeah, you have the group that get the treatment or, or that has the disease or whatever, and then using um, standard statistical techniques, you, you, you try to um, okay, then make a decision. Yeah? But in some domains, I mean, you are not uh, in the position to do that. I mean, and in economics, I mean, you, you, okay, if you want to know whether, let's say, that uh, two different uh, economic systems um, if you want to compare them, then you cannot set, uh, set up a controlled experiment. Yeah. And uh, so now the uh, now uh, uh, an approach today is that, okay, we are collecting uh, a lot of uh, data, observational, observational data. Yeah. While if you study as a scientist uh, causality, you are intervening in the, in, in the reality. And that's the, the, uh, the way how you discover causality. Yeah. And now the question is, is it possible to uh, look at observational data only and, and still to say something about causality? So this is the question what they want to, to address both in, 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 in uh, uh, health, economics, and in, in, in computer science. But okay, by the way, probability theory also plays a role there, and in itself is often contraintuitive, and even in this context is more contraintuitive. So in that sense, it's a hard topic to study because uh, it clashes a lot uh, with your uh, intuitions you have in that domain. But a lot is going on over there. And by the way, another thing, if you're interested in, in uh, computer science uh, in general or machine learning uh, in particular, there are a lot of resources available online for free. Uh, for instance, one of the interesting things is the so-called machine learning summer school. So this is a summer school for PhD students. And um, so a, a number of topics are addressed over there by the experts in the, the field. So for instance, if you would type uh, MLSS uh, causality, then you will find a lot of online lectures. And it's like not exactly an introduction because it's for these these students that want to work in that field, but at least you know what is the state of the art. Do you have some for bachelor's, master's, different levels, or maybe you don't need yeah, to yeah. If I don't okay, but there is there, there is uh, there is uh, one that I'm now using for the course uh, adaptive system seminar, which is called um, statistical rethinking. So if you Google and um, okay, it's, um, 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 and it's online with, okay, COVID in mind, so it was developed as an online course. And this is an introductory one to Bayesian thinking. And he's a scientist, he's an anthropologist, but actually it's very good. And, uh, maybe because he's an anthropologist, it's very good because you have to explain a lot <laughs> that maybe a computer scientist, you assume uh, that no. But also there are a number of lectures where causality is discussed. So I think this is maybe the, a, a good starting point to, to, to start with. Um, okay, and so then, um, um, so statistical probability, and this is where we, we are today, the domains and um, artificial intelligence. We'll leave time for questions because we have a bunch of questions in the chat. Yeah. There are very many good questions in the chat. Okay, maybe what I will do now, I will switch to, to um, uh, the browser and just pick um, a few uh, topics. That's one of the drawbacks of getting old. <laughs> 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 
the green button. And also, uh, by uh, education, I'm a philosopher and mathematician, so I'm not very practical in <laughs> using computers for I don't know how many years. So what we see over here is like the, 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 the basic idea of reinforcement learning. Uh, okay, here it's using a mouse, but could be a robot trying to find out. So you, you see a maze, that's your environment. And um, okay, and in that maze, uh, you see the, the mouse in the center. And then in the right corner, you have a cheese. So of course, the, the, the mouse tries uh, to bend that. And uh, okay, the way that the, the, the agent is operating um, uh, in the environment is that okay, you can observe the state, uh, you know where you are, and then you can decide uh, what action I can do. And for instance, uh, in, in that case, you would go like uh, this way because otherwise you, you run against a, um, a wall. Yeah. And um, each time you have uh, executed an action, you receive, you receive a reward. But in, in many cases, the reward will be zero. So for instance, the, 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 the mouse will only get a positive reward once you have found the, the, the cheese. By the way, this is the way how we learn the language. Because our parents could not uh, explain us how to talk, for instance, by, by uh, trial and error. Or it's also the way that a baby from crawling started to, to walk, or the way we learned how to bike. Yeah. And um, okay, and so this is the way that um, you are connected to, with your environment. And then you have a number of learning algorithms uh, that will return the, what is called the optimal policy. Yeah. And the optimal policy tells you in yeah, which state so, you are. Okay, yeah, it's you start to go the beginning. And which state, uh, for each uh, state, it will tell you what action you have to execute. Yeah. And you are, uh, and okay, and sometimes that can be a stochastic action. And for instance, um, in 50% of the cases, you go left, and in 50% of the cases, you go right. And okay, so uh, uh, if you contrast this with the other machine learning algorithms, okay, you, um, it's, it's, uh, I should have touched. Yeah. So uh, contrasted with unsupervised learning, okay, you have no feedback at all. Uh, contrasted to, to super, uh, uh, supervised machine learning, nobody will tell you what is the right action. It's only at the end that you have a reward. Yeah. And uh, for instance, for uh, the Internet of Things um, uh, applications or for control problems, this is often the, the kind of information which is available. For instance, a thermostat uh, at home uh, connected to the internet. Well, uh, the, the, there are no trading data that gives you the, the right answer. You, you, okay, you see that people will start to, to, to change the thermostat, and okay, then they are not happy with the temperature. Yeah. So this can be uh, applied in, in many domains, and uh, I'm sure in uh, IoT it will be important, in robotics it's important. So uh, you have probably seen these walking robots. So Often they learn, but then first in a simulation offline before um, you, you, you do it in the real world. So this is one of the, the major um, uh, learning techniques that we are doing in the, in the AI lab. Yeah. And um, so the, Okay, and, um, and, and one of the reasons is that um, a major um, research area is multi-agent systems. Yeah. And in the case of multi-agent systems, you have more than one agent. Yeah. And then the situation uh, changes dramatically. Yeah. I mean, standard machine learning, what you are doing there is optimization. Yeah. And in a sense, your opponent is the environment. Uh, but the, the environment uh, there does not change over time. Okay, it can be stochastic, but the, the environment will not try to, to make it difficult for you. Yeah. Why, if, uh, if you have more than one agent, and here you have a classical example, which is called the, the prison's dilemma. So here you have two agents, and, um, and they have two actions available. 
So both they can uh, cooperate or they can uh, bet uh, betray each other. Yeah. And then they have what in economics, because game theory started uh, in the context of microeconomics, but even to today in um, computer science in general, so outside the context of uh, artificial intelligence, you have a major area which is called algorithmic game theory. Because a lot of um, solutions and, and, and uh, game theory, I mean, it's hard to compute them, etc. Yeah. And, um, and okay, so this is here one of the, the most simple examples. Yeah. And the two agents, they have uh, what is called a payoff in, in, uh, in economics, but we, we would call it rewards. Yeah. And of course, both agents, they, they want to maximize their rewards. And for instance, if they would uh, both cooperate, then they would get a reward, uh, both of one. Yeah? While, for instance, if uh, player B is cooperating and player A is betraying, then player B will get a reward of, um, um, I think it should be the opposite. Okay, it's not that important. Um, so, okay, so these are the rewards for the two players. Okay, now why do we uh, talk here about strategic interaction? Because the, what, what the, the, the player gets as payoff not only depends on your own actions, but also depends on the other player's actions. And that's why it becomes a problem of strategic interactions. And okay, if you are playing uh, chess, that's a, a game of strategic interaction. For instance, two, um, two, um, um, department stores, chains in Kenya competing with each other is a situation of strategic direction. And uh, okay, if you if you look at the, the situation, yeah, they would be better off. Problem is that in this uh, payoff matrix. Yeah, I think there's something. Be, uh, yeah, it should be corporate, corporate. Yeah, to, to I think the trade. corporate and the has to be changed in position. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so, but if you look at so the best situation for both um, uh, would be betray, be betray in this example. Yeah. So both get the payoff of uh, two. Yeah. Um, so on average, for the two of them, that that's the, the solution that you want to do. But, but actually what, what um, um, uh, will happen is that both will take, sorry, both will take uh, the, the corporate, the one one, yeah? Because this is the so-called uh, uh, Nash equilibrium, yeah? Because for instance, um, you both realize that um, if you would select two two, then it's better off for the, for uh, both of us. Yeah. But then each of them can also realize that if I switch to the alternative, then I increase my payoff from two to three. Yeah. And then they are both uh, tempted to, to do that. Yeah. Um, and they will end up in the, the, the one one situation. Yeah. And you, you meet this a lot in reality. Okay, for instance, um, uh, competing blocks and 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 and, and wealth politics, uh, they would be better off to to invest more money in ed education, uh, whatever, rather than their armies. But what happens is they invest in their armies. Yeah, and you have many situations like this, and this is the, the I mean this is the framework needed um, um, in order to 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 to, to work and um, to understand. Um, uh, situations where you have strategic interactions. Okay. Uh, and then a specialized area in, in, uh, in game theory is what, what they call uh, mechanism design. Yeah. And there what you try to do is you try to define the rules of the game so that even that players only look at their own interest and want to, 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 to maximize their own interest, that they will end up in a situation which is, which is good for, for everyone. And one example is a uh, okay, long time ago, maybe before your age, you had the so-called peer-to-peer networks uh, where you could download videos, music, and you could upload. Now, of course, most people are interested in downloading rather than, than uploading. 
And one of the, the incentives, uh, so mechanisms of design is then about incentives. So one of the incentives was that, you, have you any idea that what were the incentives that were built in in that system? Okay, the download speed dependent on your up, uh, upload uh, capacity. Another example is uh, if you're not careful, you will end up in this situation as Wikipedia. Uh, I mean, it's open source, available for everyone. Who has ever consulted here a Wikipedia? Who has contributed to Wikipedia? <laughs> Uh, okay, at least a point on them. Yeah. And so in order to understand it, it goes much further than, than, than AI alone, to understand this kind of uh, situations and in uh, computer science in general, uh, many of the problems you want to solve, you have strategic interaction involved and you have to look at, uh, at game theory on the one hand, sometimes mechanism theory, I mean, to, to, the, to find the rules so that uh, you give players incentives to behave in such a way that everyone is happy. Uh, but the problem is okay to, to, to find the so-called uh, equilibrium. And because why will you end up uh, in the one-one situation? Because if, if one player unilaterally changes, yeah, he can never or she can never improve the payoff. Yeah? And that's why they will stick over there. And that's the so-called Nash equilibrium. And okay, I mean, to calculate them in a complicated situation is uh, very difficult. So um, a lot of things are, are happening over there. Uh, and one alternative, one alternative um, of calculating this Nash equilibrium is to apply machine learning. So this is one of the things we are doing. I don't know how long I'm busy. So maybe I give one more example. I think we can move to questions. Or maybe now we can yeah, uh, finish now. Let's move to questions. And then everyone can yeah. uh, uh, ask questions and uh, I'll do my best. <laughs> yeah, we have some good ones from the chat. So someone's going to read some of them out and then mm -hmm. you can have a chance to answer mm -hmm. the guys on the chat. Right. Um, hope you can all hear me. So there's several questions I don't know how to go about this. I'll start the one by Victor Cherule. What are some of the areas within explainable AI that needs further research outside cost explanation? And I could link it up with a question from Felix, how different or intertwined is causality with explainability? Okay, uh, first of all, um, okay, there are a few concepts to which are used, explainable also and uh, uh, interpretive, yeah, and different people have a different meaning about that. Uh, but it's not, it's not because you can uh, interpret the knowledge you have in a neural network, for instance, yeah? because a lot of that knowledge is basically nonsense. Yeah? Okay, one, one example, for instance, is uh, uh, a bank in Chicago used its data to decide um, to decide uh, to whom uh, to give a loan. Yeah. And then one of the rules uh, that could be derived from the neural network was if the surname ends with ski, then it's better not uh, uh, not to give a loan. Yeah. Well, that's a rule that you can interpret, but okay, what does it mean? And uh, and 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 and, and uh, okay. And by the way, also uh, in machine learning, what you are discovering uh, are correlations, and correlations are saying uh, not a lot. Okay, for some. For, for some uh, situations, that's okay. I mean, if you're a, a marketing company and, and um, okay, if you discover that, I mean, people which want to invest money and, and, and uh, going to restaurants are living in this part of the city, well, that correlation is not to decide I will build uh, there a new restaurant. Yeah. But for many other applications, I mean, you need to understand. And in my opinion, the only good explanation is a causal explanation. But again, I mean, it's now one of the hot topics uh, in machine learning, and often it's counterintuitive. Uh, yeah, cool. thank you. So, I uh, guess because in the interest of time, one or two more. Um, so, Timothy asked, I'm curious how missing values were handled before the statistical phase. And I think that was in the chat that you had. Yeah. So, he's asking, was it based on human intuition or how was that handled? Yeah. Okay. So, um, uh, okay, this is one of the problems that, that uh, uh, has to be addressed in causality. I mean, what we would like to know is based on the data that we have available, 
observational data, I mean, you didn't intervene in the reality, and based on this data, rather than discovering uh, correlations, you would like to, to find causality. Now, for instance, it's possible that I, I have, uh, I have um, okay, information about the size of, of hand of peoples, and I have information about the size of their uh, vocabulary. Yeah. And I discovered the correlation that, uh, okay, there's a strong correlation. Yeah. The more words you know, the, 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 the bigger your hands. But if you want to understand this, uh, then, okay, you need to know about the age of the people, but it's possible that you don't have uh, information. And so you, you have to, 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 to handle um, okay, what they call latent uh, variables, hidden variables, etc. And uh, okay, that's where uh, also patient inference um, is uh, playing a role. By the way, Microsoft has uh, an interesting tool called Two Skill. Um, okay, a lot of people are playing uh, games online. And um, okay, what you like uh, to do is to match uh, players about the same level. If I match, uh, play, okay, if, if I match you with someone who's too strong, you're not happy, and also the other one is not happy. So you try to, to uh, uh, okay, that the skill of a person is then you don't have data about that, and uh, the, using Bayesian inference, um, uh, they can derive that. And okay, it's a tool available. I think it's called Two Skill by uh, Microsoft to match players. And by the way, it's even explained because I use it as an example uh, for my courses. It's explained no. by <laughs> it's explained by uh, Chris Bishop, I think, who's the director, who's the director of the research lab in Cambridge. Uh, cool. I think can we take one more. Yes, this starts from the basic of what does responsible AI really mean? How do you represent it and measure it? And also, Victor added. What are your thoughts on the emerging concept on the, the topic of responsible AI? That's a difficult question. <laughs> uh, and actually, I mean, th th this is not, uh, I mean, of course, AI people has, has to think about them, but not only AI people have to think about them. Yeah? I mean, that should be a political question. Uh, of course, um, it must be an informed uh, decision because sometimes uh, lawyers uh, and politicians are making decisions. For instance, in Europe, we have uh, uh, what is it called? GD. I forgot there is a law about the use of data. I forgot the yeah. 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 Um, and they are quite strict. And for instance, you cannot use data for purposes for which they were not collected. Yeah. I think that's not a good thing to do. So you have to have uh, an informed uh, discussion. Everyone should be involved. Uh, um, yeah. By the way, it's not only an AI that people should behave responsibly. It's overall for use for other technologies. Okay, okay well, one of the issues today is autonomous weapons. Uh, there is an organization of AI people against autonomous weapons. And they have a video, you can check it online. I mean, they, they can make uh, drones this size. That's on the video, and the drones this size, which can operate uh, autonomously. I mean, they, they have the, the, the picture of the person they have to address. And uh, in a large group, they, they go up for that person, they end up on the forehead like a mosquito and a bullet through the head. So that's possible today, yeah. But also in other areas, um, uh, in health, uh, whatever. Okay, by the way, one of the countries um, that um, is like the advanced in the sense of the use of data is Estonia, one of the EU countries, because all the data are, are um, owned by the government. So all data which are collected are owned by the government. And they can only be used by uh, anyone if the, the no are owned by the people, yeah, but are collected, stored by the government, and it's the and they are collected almost everything, and it's only when these people that are agreeing that um, a company or whatever can use the data. By the way, also Iceland has some interesting things. So they have a DNA of uh, every um, person born in the country. 
So of course, um, I mean that could be very useful for, for, for research. <laughs> uh, but again, it's the same rules. I mean they are stored by the government, but it's the 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 the, 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 the people that own um, the data. Yeah. Uh, it's a very interesting area, but it should not only be um, uh, in the hands of, of uh, AI people. Uh, everyone has to be involved. Uh, but okay, my personal opinion is okay, only restrict when there are good reasons. So keep it uh, as open as possible. Great. All right. Thank you so much. Um, a little bit more of a prosaic question and just to go up against the definitions of adaptation. Uh, Is it interactive uh, so that we end and then we can sort of you so that you can also online. Yeah. Yeah, so thank you so much, everyone who has joined us even online. Uh, we appreciate that you took time to join the Mari session, and uh, we'll be having this um, seminars every month. So, Santé Sana, and let's applaud Prof for joining us and giving us. So we are still in the building. You in the building, and you have a question. I think we can meet at the coffee place. I think Prof will have a few minutes before this. Yeah. No, I mean. Uh, I'm available, so uh, yeah, perfect. Yeah, I'm not in a rush. Yes, now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.